Good morning and welcome to the October 4th, 2020 Tapestry Worship Gathering. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're reaching out to other people. I hope that you are not feeling isolated and you're helping others not to feel isolated. Just a few announcements today. Number one, uh, we are uh, looking at a couple of different spots. We're trying to figure out a way for us to be able to, to meet together safely. And there are a couple of spots that uh, we are looking at right now. When we find a spot to meet in, uh, that will not end the, the video gatherings because not all of us will feel comfortable. Not all of us should be uh, at our gatherings right now. We need to make sure that each person is safe and that we do all of this in the safest possible way. So these video gatherings will continue. They may just look a little differently because it may be a live uh, gathering at that point. There'll be more information on that as we know more. Uh, for now, if you know of any spots, Please let me or a member of the leadership team know about them. Next, uh, Pam has an announcement on a way that we can help our community. So I'll let her tell you about that. Hi Threads, this is Pam. I wanna show you this awesome pile of wonderful things that the hands dropped by this morning and encourage you to do the same. I have recently become aware through a friend at Head Start that there is a big need. As you may know, Head Start is a program focused on um, low-income families to give their children a head start before they start formal education. Many of these families are already struggling and have, since the pandemic started, lost jobs and um, many are facing homelessness. They do have their needs for food being met, but there's a huge need for toiletries, hygiene related items, and cleaning supplies. None of those things are covered by food stamps or WIC or any other government programs. So what we're doing, and this is ongoing as long as the pandemic lasts, we are collecting hygiene items such as body wash, soap, hand sanitizer, toothpaste, toothbrushes, deodorant, feminine hygiene supplies, all those kinds of things, in addition to cleaning supplies such as laundry and dish detergent and um, disinfectant wipes, disinfectant sprays, window cleaners, all that kind of stuff. So anything you could provide would be awesome. You can drop it off whenever at, on our porch at 3311 Arborvita Lane in Plover or you can um, message us on Facebook or text us or email us or message us and we can pick it up from your house, masked and socially distanced, of course, because we want to keep each other safe. Please consider helping out. And again, this is not going to go away. So every time you do your shopping, maybe you know grab a couple bottles of dish detergent or um, a few extra tubes of toothpaste or something like that and add it to the pile. Also, another thing that is needed are masks for children. Many of the children have one mask, period. And you know, preschoolers, they're going to pull them down, put them in their mouth, drop them on the floor, etc. So any child size masks are also appreciated. Thank you so much for being the hands and feet in Jesus and loving our community in a tangible way. Paul writes the following instructions to us in his second letter to Timothy. He says the following, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we might live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So Paul urges us to pray for uh, those who have political authority over us. Regardless of whether or not we agree with them, we are to pray for them. And as many of you know, probably most of you know, our president now has COVID-19. The president of the United States has COVID-19. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we are called to pray for those who have political authority over us, regardless of whether, uh, whether we agree with them or not. So if you would please join me right now and praying for the President of the United States. Most gracious God, the God who is the great physician, I ask right now 
as you have made us fearfully and wonderfully, as you know our bodies better than anyone else, Lord, that you heal the President of the United States, that you heal him not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually also, that he would know that there is a God who is creator and sustainer of this universe, and that he would know of the justice and the love that you seek. I ask, Father, that you work through his body to get rid of this virus, that you cause the doctors and the nurses and the technicians that are around him to know exactly what to do, and that he would be able to express gratitude to a God who cares very much for him and cares for all of us. I ask now, Lord, as we pray for those who are in political leadership over us, Father, that you help us uh, to exercise the authority we have in such a way that we please you, that we exercise it with justice and with love, that we would take care of those who are in need. Help us now to proclaim how worthy you are as we worship together. I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship together, okay? words saying I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery you shall have no other gods before me you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. In 19, uh, 1980, in 1998, I have more than 251 babies under two years. And I can feed them. In, in the morning, I have nothing. I said, God, what a... And the, the, the love make me inventor. I go to the uh, commercial and ask milk, ask this, and today, you have seen what, what is a, a hospital, a farm, nursing school, or a cinema, and so like that. Because I let God realize his um, mission in me. It's not me. No, I am nothing. It's only the love of God who sent me, go there. And I am not, why I must be afraid? The fear is the contrary of the love. If you love, you are not afraid. You have confidence, you trust. I have, I said always that I have triumphed Trust in God. Triumph our confidence in God, in providence. Because I know, now I know nobody can stop me. Yeah. Nobody. They, I give you one example. During the war, I take, of course, the, the plane from Brazil to Bujumbura. And they, when we were um, uh, landing, they make 60, boom, boom, boom. They try with a uh, rocket, with, uh, but it's a, uh, and we, we land. But the, the plane was full of 60, 16, pew, 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 in fact. And the co-pilot was, uh, uh, and we were there. Because I said, the other passengers began to say, I said, no, God, you can't allow that. My children now, they, they can't be again orphans. You can't do that. You can't. And, and the uh, crew uh, came and said, sit down, please. Don't, it's very dangerous. You must sit down. I said, no, I prefer to die on the ground, fighting. And then they look at me, they said, uh, always they die, uh, lie or sit. You, uh, you will see, I will die, stand up and so, and the plane. Because all those miracles, it's a miracle. It's the house, the home of min, min, uh, God's miraculous. Yeah. Psalm 19 for the director of music, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they displayed knowledge. 
There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from its pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one of one end of the heavens, and it makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The Lord of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden thought, faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgressions? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So we're on the 18th week of Paul's letter to the Romans, and uh, we're going to finish the last of this trifecta of chapters that we're dealing on Paul's brothers and sisters, his Hebrew brothers and sisters, and uh, how he saw that God was working there. So we're going to read all of the 11th chapter and then talk briefly through it, okay? So if you would uh, grab your Bibles or just listen to me, this is what the Word of the Lord says. I asked then... Did God reject his people? 
by no means. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What, uh, what then? What the people of Israel th uh, sought so earnestly they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel en envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their, their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconcil reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the, the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing, nourishing sap of the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I, might be, uh, I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. If God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare, spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in, in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to, the nature, uh, to that nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted in to their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of these, this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths before tracing, uh, beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? From, for, for, for from him and through him, and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Guys, there's a lot going on in this passage, but I want to start off with a story that has nothing to do with the passage. So 
Uh, I've been trying for like the past two months to order me another Stormy Cromer hat. I, I'm, I, as you guys know, I'm an Alabama guy, but I love some of the Midwestern things. And one of the things I love is, is these Stormy Cromer hats that come from uh, the UP, from Upper Michigan. And and so I got one a while back and then I finally decided I needed a fall hat and um, I, got, I tried to get another one. So I have ordered this same stupid hat from Amazon five times. And each time I ordered a size seven and a half inch hat. Yes, your, your pastor has a big head, literally physically has a big head. And um, all five times they've sent me the wrong size. Hey, literally, all five times. The past two times I have been on chat with them saying, the, the previous times you sent me the wrong size, I need to make sure. And they, they were all like, no, 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 oh, it must have been a wrong order. And then they'd look and they'd go, it was, you ordered the right thing. We sent you the wrong thing. It, it'll change this time. I, I got the last one uh, this past week and I sent my family photos. Uh, it's like, hey, here's another chance. We're gonna see what happens. The order was right. Uh, they made sure of that. And I open up the bag and it is a seven and a quarter again. You see, we're used to people messing up and when people mess up, we tend to give up on them. So like in my case, it only took me five times, but after the fifth time, I no longer ordered uh, my hat through Amazon. Supposedly, I have one coming directly from Stormy Cromer and we'll see how that works out. But God's different than us. He doesn't give up on us. And, and that's what Paul is writing about here. He's writing about uh, his people whom he loves very much. Okay, it, it, our word, the word of God that we turn to is not an anti-Semitic text. And when, whenever someone who claims to be a Christian brings out anti-Semitism, they are not speaking from this word, okay? They are not speaking from this word. Because at the essence of Christianity is us admitting that we are in love with and are loved by and need the Hebrew Messiah. It's one of the things that just dumbfounds me. And Paul loves his people. He's not rejecting his people. He in no way thinks that God has somehow replaced the Hebrew people with us as though they were his chosen people initially and now they've sinned and he just pushes them out of the way and now he claims us instead. What he's been talking about is, is that God used Israel's disobedience to bring other people into his way. His promise to Abraham was that Abraham would be the father of many nations, and he is fulfilling that promise through this path. This path where Israel has a covenant with a faithful God even though Israel has not been faithful. And God uses their unfaithfulness to now bring us in. The way Paul describes it is he takes an olive tree, and he actually does the opposite. Okay, I am not a farmer. I am definitely not an olive farmer, but I have read enough on this to know that typically what would happen is you would find uh, the, the uh, root of a wild olive tree and you would graft into it cultivated branches because a wild olive tree uh, does not produce as much fruit as a cultivated olive tree. And so therefore you would wanna use the energy of the wild root and then graft it with cultivated branches. And Paul's taking that and he's describing it differently. He's using a traditional symbol of Israel to, to make a point here. And the traditional symbol of Israel would be the olive tree. And he's saying some of those branches were broken off that you, the wild olive tree, might be cultivated into it, that you might be grafted into it. And, and for us, that means that we should never have this sense of pride. We should never, ever, ever put up with anti-Semitism uh, anti at all, okay? When we do, we allow insults to be thrown at the people of our Messiah. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> geese just flew over, it, over me. It scared me a little. Um, I thought I had a weird amen happening there. Yes, Paul loves his people. He's not rejecting them. And he starts off this passage by saying, has God rejected them? And he's like, no. He, he uses a story from El, the prophet Elijah 
to convey this, that God is always leaving this remnant so that the remnant might be, might be the means through which he continues to, to honor his promise to the patriarchs. And the story he's using at this point with Elijah is where Elijah has just faced down um, Jezebel and, and uh, all of the prophets of, of Baal and Asherah. So this momentous occasion where, where Elijah goes up on Mount Carmel and uh, mocks their God because there's 850 of them that are sacrificing their God. And he then basically says, all right, everybody gather around me and we're going to just do this offering to, to uh, Yahweh. And before that happens, I want you to cover it in water and then cover it in water again. And then he prays and he says, Lord, answer me. And God answers him in fire and he consumes the offering. And um, then Elijah, well, he gets scared and he runs away. And he runs and he hides. And when he runs and he hides, God makes his presence known to him. And when God makes his presence known to him, Elijah says, I'm the only one left. They've rejected you, they've rejected me. I'm the only one left. And God's response to him is, no, you're not. There are 7,000 that I've kept from bowing to Baal. There are 7,000 that I've kept faithful to me. That God was keeping this remnant and this remnant would be the means through which he fulfills his promises to Israel. Because God always fulfills his promises. God always is faithful. And Paul knows this. He knows that while his people may not have recognized Jesus as the Messiah for now, that God will work in such a way that he will still fulfill his promises to Israel. God will work in such a way that he will still fulfill everything that he said he, uh, said he was going to do. Because that's what he does. God is always faithful. That's Paul's point here. He's going to be faithful to Israel. He has been faithful to Israel. Now, we're, we're not Jews. We are not Hebrews. We are not children of, of Jacob. But we are grafted into that. And we get to know that God is always faithful to us too. That, that God is faithful to accomplish what he says he's going to accomplish. To, to quote scripture here, he who began a good work in you is going to accomplish it. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. Even if it's in ways that we cannot possibly comprehend. Paul desperately wanted his fellow Hebrews to come to this knowledge of grace and faith that is in Christ. To no longer try and have to earn salvation, but instead just merely receive it from the Messiah who came to give it to him. And he knows that in the end, God is going to make it happen because he is always faithful to his promises. What is it you need God to do? What is it you need him to do right now? Know that he's faithful. At the end of the day, he's always faithful to his promises. That's why Paul ends with this doxology. If you remember, we sing a doxology every week. And what it means is glory saying. Paul cannot help but at the end when he remembers that God is always faithful, he cannot help but respond in glory. And he says the following, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? who has ever given to God that God should repay them. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? who has ever given to God that God should repay him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. O oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
how unsearchable his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For, f for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That's a good way for us to end it. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Our God is faithful. He's faithful to accomplish what he says he uh, will do. Know that. Would you please join with me in singing our closing prayer? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord God Almighty is faithful to what he said to Abraham. He is faithful to what he said to Jacob. He is faithful to what he has said to all his people. And for those of you who proclaim that Jesus is your Lord, you are his people. He is faithful to you also. So be faithful to him. He will accomplish the impossible. Have a great week. Hello, kids. We are going to continue talking about Moses today. We are almost finished with the story of Moses. And this will be a little bit of a review of a story we've talked about before and then we'll get into some new stuff so this is from numbers 21 facing the giants there lived in the land that god had promised to his people some very powerful and wicked men who were so much taller and stronger than anyone else these giants ruled their land by fear when Moses and the Israelites reached the promised land, they sent out 12 spies to find out all they could about the people who lived there. Remember these 12 spies went out and they came back with fruit and reports of very big people. But when the 12 spies returned, 10 of them brought a terrifying report. The people are stronger and taller than we are. We felt like grasshoppers. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw giants there. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, had seen the giants, but they weren't afraid. The Lord our God will fight for us, they said. But everyone was so scared they would not go on. As a result, the Israelites wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years, too frightened to enter the promised land. After 40 years, all those who lived by fear and not faith had died. Moses had told the people to put their trust in God and marched to capture the land on the eastern side of the River Jordan. Ahead of them was the land of the Amorites, led by a gigantic king called Sihon. I don't know if you guys can hear my cat Hanks, but he is wanting to participate this morning. They sent messengers to King Sihon asking for permission to pass peacefully through the land, but he refused. Powerful King Sihon gathered a large army to fight for them. This time the Israelites did not run away, but trusted God and marched to fight the mighty Sihon and his army. God gave his people an amazing victory. 
King Sihon and his army were defeated, and the land between Arnon and Jabbok river valleys was captured. Ahead of them was another great challenge. The land of Bashan was ruled by an even bigger giant, King Og. King Og and his army had a reputation for being as tall as the cedar trees and strong as the oaks. King Og ruled over 60 fortified cities. He was known as one of Rephaim, meaning terrible ones. They were giants and fierce fighters. King Og could have been between 8 and 12 feet tall. We estimate this because he had a bed made of iron that was 13 and a half feet long and 6 feet wide. The Lord said to Moses, Do not be afraid of King Og, for I have delivered him into your hands, along with the whole army and his land. Do to him what you did to Sihon, king of Amorites. The Israelites marched along the road toward Bashan, while King Og and his army marched out to fight them at a place called Edrei. God gave Moses and the Israelites victory. King Og was struck down, together with his sons and his whole army, leaving no survivors. The Israelites later wrote psalms commemorating the great victory God gave them over these giants. God struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sihon king of Amorites, Og king of Bashan. And this is in Psalm 135 and 136. God had promised Moses that he would start to make all the other nations afraid of them. They will tremble with fear when anyone mentions you, and they will be terrified when you show up. Even the most powerful Canaanite kings began to fear the power of God. As a result, God's people were no longer too scared to face the giants and powerful armies that lay ahead. They learned to trust God no matter how big the problem. God asks us to trust him too. There is no one or no problem that is too big or powerful for God.